Richard, can I start with you? Sure can. Richard, this show tonight, Collision Course, is about just like what I said. I would like each of us to do a short summary about what's the most important thing going on in, out in space right now as it relates to what you have been researching. And, and I really want the good stuff. I want to know what's most relevant right now. And if you want to talk about maybe, because I know you spoke about my images before, if you want to talk about the images, if that's most important, or if it's something else. Do you think you could give us a five-minute summary? Just five minutes, so that's going to be hard. <laughs> how, about ten, how about ten? I'll double it to ten. Is that going to be okay? Uh, all right, let me, let me take a shot at this. I'm also getting ready to do Coast tonight, so everybody who's on the line, I will be on with George Nori tonight talking about some additional developments in space. The UR spacecraft coming back, NASA finally picking a major new launch vehicle, which is going to open up the moon, Mars, asteroids, the whole nine yards, which has been a long time coming. Hopefully I'll have enough time to go through some of the politics and, and actually show why we're going to get this one this time, because it's going to be in on, on under budget and on time, and it's basically reusing the shuttle technology, which is what the first you know mission that George Bush tried to do back to the moon did not do which priced us out of basically the solar system. Let me focus on Francis' request and talk a bit about L&E. As you may know, um, I have a major background in astronomy. I was head of special projects and public affairs at the Hayden Planetarium in New York for many years. I was a NASA consultant on both the Apollo project as well as later on. Um, I was a, a science advisor to CBS News. Uh, where I advise Walter Cronkite on the Apollo project, I do kind of know something about space. And what intrigued me about Alanine was there was all this fuss being made all over the Internet, YouTube especially, about a nothing object, a nothing comet. I mean, there's like six or a dozen now going through the inner solar system, which are brighter, more spectacular, more more definite, more consistent than this little thing called Elanine. So I was looking initially at why all the fuss. So I started looking at numbers, because that's what science does. We look at numbers. And as I began looking at the ephemeris for Elanine, published by JPL, and I should make a note that, you know, for someone who claims they don't believe much of what NASA says these days, why would I be trusting a JPL site in Elanine? Because the data doesn't come from JPL. The data comes from people like Francis and Ian and a lot of other amateur astronomers all over the world, which are dumped into this kind of clearinghouse at JPL, the small body site, which then posts the ephemeris so that any amateur anywhere in the world can point their telescope particularly go-to telescopes to where Elanine should be, and bingo, there it is. If that data was wrong, if that data had been jiggered, if that data had been manipulated in any way, then nobody, including Francis, could ever have pointed his telescope half a planet away, right remote control at Elanine, and even found the damn thing. So yes, we start from this common database, over 2,000 observations now, going back to, I believe, December... 12th is their earliest observation after Elanine posted uh, to Harvard that he'd found this new little comet, and that's where I began. And as I started looking at this ephemeris, remember, with numbers that have to be right, otherwise no one could find this object. What struck me over and over again, and I'm not going to bore everybody with the details, but I started doing probability calculations because one number kept coming up again and again and again. Now, a slight diversion. NASA just published its uh, probability numbers on the idea that somebody somewhere on the planet will be hit by a piece of the UR satellite coming back in on September 23rd now. They've narrowed it down to within a day or so of September 23rd. How do they get a probability of one chance in 3,200 that if you're standing outside in a field or in your house or in your car, you're going to be hit by a piece of the satellite coming in? We used exactly the same calculations that NASA is using, because it's not very esoteric. It's basically the area under the satellite, the number of times it goes around, the rate at which it's being decreased, and the, the length of the reentry arc, which is going to be about 10,000 miles, the width of the arc, which is going to be a few hundred miles left to right of that path, 
and they basically do it as an area calculation and the number of people that might be living in that area at any one time, and that's how they derive their 1 in 3,200 number. Using the same approach, the odds now that Elamine is a comet, is a natural object, is in fact anything approaching, anything the human race has ever dealt with in space before, are over 400 billion, with a B, to one, that this thing is not natural. And that's why I was terrifically excited to see Francis posting on September 2nd, a week after all the mainstream guys said, oh, it's gone, it's disappeared, it's safely collapsed, it's disintegrated, it's, it's no longer an object to see that Francis did what every astronomer just needs to do in the face of overwhelming nonsense, take observations. And the crucially interesting thing about Francis' observations is he took them in narrow spectral bands, very narrow line filters showing that under these conditions, in H-alpha, in sulfur, in, uh, in the infrared, elamine is anything but a normal object and the more you look at it, the more unusual and bizarre it becomes. So you put all this data together, and my model now says elamine is A, artificial, B, it could do anything between now and as close as its approach or even after. No astronomer on the planet, because they're not looking at this data the way one has to look at it, even knows what they're talking about because they're trying to compare a comet with an object which is demonstrably not a comet, even if it is outgassing. And so any projections based on the comet model are erroneous and are not taking into account real data, which says, again, using the same methodology as NASA with the UR's reentry, the odds of this thing being natural are billions to one against it being natural. Ergo, it must be artificial. It has a design. We do not yet know what the purpose of that design is, so stay tuned. That's a great summary, Richard. Thank you, Mr. Hoagland. Thank you very much for, for doing it that way. Uh, now, what's, what I want to do is, because we have some other people at the table, is I want everybody to ask a question. And it, will that be okay if we ask you a question now and you'll answer it for us? Go, go, shoot. I'm, I'm going to go ahead and start, because, Richard, I have a hard time believing that it's controlled. And the reason why I have a hard time believing that it's controlled is because the way I've been taking the pictures is by the, the NASA-generated minor planet observatory-generated ephemerides that tell me where, or tell the telescopes where to point. How does the controlled object get so in tune with the coordinates that whenever I use the coordinates, I can find it? Is there an explanation for that? Yeah, I, I, that's an excellent question, Francis, because I think a lot of people, when you say an object is artificial, they assume that it's under powered flight, that it's got its engines running. This thing is on a ballistic Keplerian Newtonian trajectory. Like, uh, let me give you an example. Let's have two guys. Let's, let's make uh, one, um, oh, I'm trying to think, uh, uh, Jim, Jim Bunning, who's currently a senator in the Senate. Jim Bunning used to be a pitcher, right? He was a good bunter. Okay. If he throws a fastball over the plate, that ball, which was made in a factory somewhere, and he's throwing it, make it an artificial object, even if the moment it leaves his hands, it's under total natural laws, gravity, air resistance, wind currents, etc., etc. If he were to scoop up a snowball, which is made of natural stuff, you know, frozen ice falling from the sky, and throw it, he would be exercising intelligent control of a natural object, but when it leaves his hand, it's also under normal natural conditions. Everyone's confusing the idea that Elamine looks like a comet and is on a ballistic trajectory, which is Newtonian, with the, with the false premise that that means it's natural, when in fact our model says even if it was a natural comet, it was put on a directed flight path by intelligent design, by some designers, by some engineers figuring out force and angle and speed, direction, time of flight, closest approach to the sun, all that stuff. And those numbers, that intelligent design in the numbers is showing up in the probability calculation I talked about moments before. 
So even though it's an artificial object, it's following up till now a perfectly natural flight path because it has to hit its marks in our model, and the marks are certain alignments, certain close approaches, certain timings, certain angles. That's how we know it's not a natural comet, but has been sent here by someone by design. Okay, so I'm gonna. Um, what I got from that was, and and we, your your hypothesis is that there's a, a tetrahedron shape inside of the inside of what I call comma Helenin, right? So it must be. Uh, hang on, you know. hang on. We only saw the tetrahedral shape when a CME blew across it, and the plasma, electrons and protons in the solar wind recombined to create hydrogen again and emitted both the H-alpha line as well as an infrared series called the Poshin series and made the shield visible. When it's an empty space and there's nothing blowing past it, that shield could just as well not be there because it's not a physical structure. It's some kind of an energy interaction with the solar wind. The actual right. object that is alanine is obviously much tinier and I've heard numbers quoted by Elanine and others, like Musgrave, three or four kilometers. That's just an estimate based on this thing being a normal comet. In fact, there is no observation of the nucleus. Even the new data that you took, particularly those H-alpha views, which have stunningly interesting geometry, which is why I really would like to get my hands on the digital copies of your original, you know, I'll send you, images. I, I will send you uh, copies of the originals, Richard. For coming on the show, you can get all five images. And what I want to say is, so what, what, I'm, what I'm thinking and what you're telling me then is, like, they have the object. Now, the tetrahedron shows up because it's kind of sort of like a shield protecting tetrahedron yep. shield. And what they did is they started off with an object wherever it started, and they got it moving. And then once they got it moving to the right trajectory to bring it to where they wanted to, they stopped propulsion, and then nature took over, sort of, right? That's exactly what we're saying. But that could change at any moment. If this thing has a mission, if someone sent it on a mission, that mission could be, and I could limit out five different scenarios just in the time we've got remaining, which I will not do, gratefully, everybody. <laughs> but it, at any moment, could change from a Newtonian classic falling object around the sun into something much more interesting, i.e. it could change course. Or, I think, frankly, it's not going to change course, it's going to change brightness. Remember, everybody's looking for the super fireworks in the sky. All it has to do is to tap into some energy reserve on board, and it goes from an invisible object. I mean, we've got hundreds of spacecraft in the solar system out there tonight that are man-made objects, right? Do you track any of them? Of course not, because well, no, they're I've invisible. Been, yeah, I've been tracking this been tracking this one intently. I want to throw out another question to you, because this question is another one that I'm going to cover tonight. The only is reason it, you're seeing it because it was outgassing. Right. Broken up or not? Richard, Me? is it? Yeah, it, and I know. I think I know what your answer is going to be, but I'm going to ask Ian: Is the comet broken up? Is your object broken up or not? Okay, my answer is based on your data, which is the last data that we have. That is, shall we say, independent and credible. It's not broken up. As I said in many posts on my Facebook pages, if it had broken up, if this little object, let's say a few kilometers across. Had, had, had cracked and you had many pieces. Each of those pieces subjected to raw, unfiltered sunlight inside the orbit of, of, of you know, Venus, almost to the orbit of Mercury, the blast of solar energy at that distance is frightening. I mean, there are many authors who have described what the sunlight is at that close distance to the sun. It would have boiled away things. You would have seen a flaring in brightness. You would have seen an enormous production of dust. You would have seen a spectacular event like Ikea Secchi back in 65. Instead, this thing in, in many images coming from Australia just kind of whipped out like someone had turned off a valve and the gas coming out of the object itself just stopped flowing out and just dissipated in a vacuum over several days because it was a huge volume to dissipate. And now we have the object in there, silent and invisible, still on course, still on target, as far as the last images I've seen. And 
and NASA updated its ephemeris just a few days ago showing nothing has changed.